part of a system, a complex system. And because you're dealing with people, um, and people come from a variety of cultures and disciplines and backgrounds, um, we're not going to get it right. And so we do it by slow incremental steps. We build, test, modify, learn a lot, and then repeat over and over and over again. But to us, design, therefore, is a way of thinking. And it can be addressing any problem. When you build something, the building can be a, can be a set of protocols. It could be a procedure. It could be a way of behaving. It doesn't have to be a physical device. So as we evolved this, we decided that we didn't want to call the people that we were studying, we didn't want to call them users, we decided to call them people or humans. So we call it people-centered design or human-centered design. Today though, as we look at bigger and bigger problems, focus upon people, society, and culture, that's not enough. We need to add the environment. We need to add all of humanity. So maybe HCD is not just human-centered design, it's humanity-centered design. But in all of this, it's a way of thinking. So there's climate change. Is it caused by people? Well, yeah, science says so. It's caused by these big manufacturing plants spewing carbon dioxide and other noxious fumes into the air. Well, but what can designers do about that? Well, in 1971, a very famous designer, Victor Papanek, wrote a book called Design for the Real World, and the subtitle was Human Ecology and Social Change, and he was really upset about what we were doing to the environment in the early 70s. He said, in fact, the very first sentence of his book said, there are professions more harmful than design but only a very few. So what did he mean by that? Well, take a look at a cell phone. The cell phone, you have to destroy the environment in order to produce the materials that go into the cell phone. Very exotic materials that are only available in a few countries of the world. Now we don't really need those materials to make a cell phone. We need those materials to make a very tiny, slim, lightweight cell phone. If we would allow the cell phone to be a little bit thicker, a little bit bigger, we could make it more environmentally friendly. Second, we keep inventing more and more wonderful materials that have all sorts of wonderful uh, characteristics, great for building stuff, except uh, what do you do with it after you throw away, after you're finished using the device? So throw away plastics, one single use plastics. We all know the problems there. The cell phone. It's very difficult to disassemble it and, and pull out the parts. I was in India recently, and in Ahmedabad, there's a big mountain of burning trash. The trash is thrown out electrical equipment, burning, emitting poisonous fumes in the air. So what we've done is we've recycled our stuff by sending it to other countries to take care of, which is not an appropriate answer. So we have, why don't we design things that are easy to keep going, to fix, to repair, and for that matter, to recycle them into new devices. We have to start with that in the very beginning. So, what are the kinds of problems that really are we facing today? And again, what can designers do and what do designers need to know to face these problems? The United Nations has a list of 17 um, important societal issues. Come on, let's go away. Hmm. Speaking of technology. <clears throat> so these are the kinds of important issues that I want to talk about today. Now, I'm not going to talk about all 17. I'm going to focus on two. I'm going to focus on climate action, because after all, the sequence this quarter is on um, climate control, climate change. And I'm going to talk about health, because a lot of the work that we do in the design lab is with the medical school and the hospital system. And second, uh, that's, of course, a problem on everybody's mind today with the coronavirus and the resulting COVID-19 disease. 
So let's take a look at what these liners might do. But before I do that, these problems aren't new. Lots of people have been thinking about the problems of global hunger, of education, about housing, about health care. So why do we need designers? There are government aid programs, the United Nations programs, the foundations, Ford, Rocke Ford Rockefeller, Gates, and many non-government organizations, and of course, lots and lots of experts. So why do we need designers? They've all been working for a long time. They're very good. Well, what do they produce? They produce massive, thick reports, and they have multiple committees, and the reports recommend massive budgets, billions of dollars, and it's going to take massive teams for decades. And the result is that basically there are very, very few successes after years and years, decades, of pulling on the experts, and massive overspending, and massive over, they're always over behind, um, over their budget, behind schedule, and oftentimes with no result at the end that is useful. So the one thing that has actually succeeded in doing is to create a whole industry of people writing books, trying to explain why this has failed. So <clears throat> one problem is that some of these problems are hard to understand. Even the scientists disagree. Scientists disagree about a lot of factors about climate change. They disagree with the way to describe it. They disagree with a lot of the different factors that go into it. They all agree upon the common causes, but scientists, well, in fact, we train scientists to disagree with one another. We don't train scientists to agree. When, you're, when you are trained in a science, one of the things you learn to do is to read a new scientific journal article and to find the holes and to find the flaws, to find the possible problems. And then what we do is we learn how to do experiments to re see if we can repeat the results or see if we can understand why they interpreted the results in the way they did. And maybe there's a different interpretation and in which other evidence would allow us to tell apart. So the part of science that's so powerful is in fact this disagreement because the continual disagreement allows actually a refinement and improvement of the ideas. But the public doesn't understand that. The public sees scientists disagreeing with each other all the time and saying, well, what do scientists know? They're always arguing with each other. No, no, that's, how, that's what science is. Science is a method. It's not a body of facts. It's a method for determining what is the most accurate way of describing something with today's knowledge. So there's a lot of disagreements. And on top of that, these aren't just science problems. So climate change is not just a scientific problem. It's also a cultural problem. It's yes, it has to do with the environment. It has to do with the way that people live and people make their living and people. It's, it's a very complex issue. It requires somebody who understands all the different disciplines to put them together. The second problem is, I love this book by how William Easterly called the tyranny of experts of saying, look, an expert has wonderful knowledge. That's why they're experts but they're abstract knowledge because you need an abstraction in order to be able to apply it to different situations over different times. And that abstraction is what gets in the way because you come into a new country or area and you understand what the problem is about poverty or sanitation or hunger or education. And you say, these are the issues and here is a solution that we know works and you prescribe it to the company, <coughs> to the country. Well, that has lots of problems. First of all, the experts do not understand the local people. They don't understand their cultures. They don't understand what they're good at, what they're bad at, what their resources are. You know, with seven and a half billion people in the world, there are really many, many clever people all around the world who really do understand the problems that they are facing. And they've already developed beginnings of an approach to try to solve them. And so they don't like it when an expert comes in and says, oh, here's your problem and here's your solution, especially when these solutions often do not fit the way that they live. So what we are recommending is that what we do is we go and find those wonderful people. And actually, this idea comes from Eric von Hippel, who's at the business school at MIT, the MIT Sloan School of Business. And what he's been calling lead user innovation is to do just that to find out how to approach some problem. Let's go around the world and find out where that's a really big problem and then find the people who are already starting to innovate and develop schemes. 
if we can help them and become mentors and facilitators, then guess what? They will accept those. So our design skills are very important as facilitation, as instructors, as helpers, but not as dictators saying, this is the result you should have. We've been studying your problem. We sent the anthropologist in. We understand what you're doing. We understand what you're not doing. We understand what you need. And so here's a solution to the problem that you didn't know you had. That doesn't work. Other issues too. Um, there's a lot of concern that the scientific community, and for that matter, the economic community, has developed a monoculture, a standard way of thinking that's true throughout the, the technological world, basically, the developed world. And that monoculture is so severe that we don't even know that we have it. But we all believe in certain ways of behaving, and certain things are just natural. They're intuitive, we say, and certain uh, ways that we actually create things in our systems of government, we assume this is the natural way. And that's not necessarily true. What we are doing is we're ignoring uh, different cultures and different ways of behaving and different ways of thinking. In fact, that's a problem in science. We often go down the wrong path for a long time because everybody's in agreement and it's really difficult to disagree with those very powerful people at the top. And the monoculture is one of the enemies. And we've also ignoring um, the everyday people, and again, the great, great variety of cultures on this earth. So there are lots of issues why the experts who have a monoculture of their own are actually not necessarily the people to solve the problems. So what can designers do? Well, we actually have designers here. So this is Lily Irani, who's a faculty member in the communication department and a member of the design lab, uh, who has uh, spent some time in India, quite a bit of time in India, studying the way that the citizens of India could do innovation. Not the, not the powerful leaders, but the everyday citizens. And as the Wired magazine put it, to really, disrupt, to, to really disrupt technology needs to listen to people. So, in design, complexity comes from the people, society, culture, and the systems, and the economics, and the environment. And therefore, modern designers have to be experts in all of this, including sustainability of the planet. So what should future designers be able to do? Well, let me give you two examples. I'm going to talk about Kim and Aaron. So we believe that in the 21st century, the design challenges are going to be things like this. So Kim might be developing a sanitation system for a rural committee in, community in India because the community outhouses pollute the water supply. But the community is very suspicious of the government and very suspicious of foreign experts. And a foreigner is anyone from outside the village, anyone even from the next town over. So how would you deal with that? And actually, I. I was recently in India and I went to some of these small towns. And it's not easy to imagine how you would put in a new sanitation system. For example, the home might be a one bedroom, a one room home, and there's no place to, to put in new pipes, new sewer lines, and they don't have running water. And to bring in running water is a very complex task. They don't have electricity either. And so if you do that, you're going to disrupt the entire community. Yes, in the end, you might argue they were better off, but they wouldn't be for the many years it would take to do this. And maybe there are other ways of doing it. We have whole new ways of doing things today. So that's a major problem. It is a design problem, but it's more than design, right? It's a lot of working with different people and trying to find an appropriate solution for this particular community. Or take Aaron, who's working with the United Nations to tackle hunger, which is their goal number two. It's going to require a wide range of multiple disciplines and probably different nations and agencies. And this means huge budgets and different groups of people and a lot of politics and cultural differences. In fact, anytime you have a large budget or something that's going to take a lot of time and involve a lot of people, it becomes a political issue. And I mean politics in the good sense, because Look, if you're going to help a lot of people, probably what you're going to do is going to also harm a number of people. They may, have to, they may have to destroy their homes and move them someplace else. 
or that may change the way they're, they're employed. It, and um, there's just a large number of issues and that's gonna require numerous compromises. And you can't say, I know the answer because there is no single answer. The answer has to be one that is acceptable to the people who are going to live with the results. So why do we think that's what a designer is about? Well, let me start off with what the design lab can do and what we're already doing. So Michael Meyer and I thought that one of the problems is our design education is not appropriate. So I described uh, Kim and Erin. Do we train people today to solve the kinds of problems that Kim and Erin would have? No, there is no discipline in the university that tackles these issues, especially from a people-centered point of view. So we've written a paper uh, in the journal Shaji, which is a Chinese design journal, but a really excellent one, uh, called Changing Design Education for the 21st Century. Now, we didn't say how to do it. We said, here's a process. We copied it from the process that the medical si system and the journalists and legal system and the business schools have all gone through over the last 100, 150 years, where they take a look at business. It started off much like design. It was a bunch of craftspeople. Or oh, in the business case, successful business people who said, I had a successful business, so I can teach people how to be successful. No, they can't. They usually have no idea what they did. They just have to be lucky. Uh, and the same with physicians. It was all sort of uh, folklore about the sort of things they did. There was no real science behind it. And the same with law. It was all done by mentorship. And so all of these different people sat down, usually foundation-based, and had a huge study about what could be done to make this more evidence-based, more systematic, a much better educational system to train the, the designers and the educators and the um, business people and the journalists and the uh, lawyers and the doctors of the future. And that's what we're proposing. And actually, we've been working with uh, IBM Design, which has decided to help us and, and help sponsor this. And so what we've started together with IBM Design, we put together a list of 10 people on the right-hand side of this picture, people from the United States, from Europe, from Asia. They represent academics and, and uh, practitioners. They represent different, many different areas of design. And then on the left, the four people there are me and Carol Brederberg, who's the director of at IBM that's sponsoring this. And we have two observers from the World Design Organization, which is based in Montreal, but is indeed across the world, because they're very much interested in what we're doing and they would like to actually to help us have this implemented across the world. We believe this is a two or three year project. It's non-trivial. We started with 10 people. We're going to go to the next stage with 100 people. In the next stage after that, perhaps 200 people for several years to develop a whole platform of conceivable curricula to train people who can do everything from make the wonderful devices that we have today as products in our homes and to solve the problems, the 16 major problems that the United Nations has, has listed. The 17th one is that we need to have lots of lots of um, programs in order to solve the 16th. So that's one thing. But engineers too are involved. So the Lemelson Foundation is devising a scheme, a whole new program, Engineering for One Planet, for environmentally responsible engineering. And uh, actually, just yesterday, I agreed to be on the advisory committee for this particular program. So those are going to be essential beginnings. But then what happens after that? So again, uh, let me give some examples of what the Design Lab is doing today. One of them, and the first thing that we started that's relevant here, is a project called Launch, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute and the Federal Communications Commission and also Amgen. Um, and it's done, the work is being done jointly with the University of Kentucky Cancer Center and the Design Lab. And the Cancer Center, well, the reason we're doing this is the National Cancer Institute said in Eastern Kentucky, in what I call the Appalachian Mountains, Appalachia Mountains is the way they call it, or that's closer anyway. 
to the way they pronounce it. Uh, in that area of Kentucky, <clears throat> we have the highest rates of lung cancer in the country, and also one of the lowest amounts of high bandwidth internet in the country. And the FCC said, well, gee, they're very isolated. They live in, they live in the mountains. Sometimes it's a long couple mile, one lane dirt road to get to their homes. Um, in the winter, they're snowed in. They can't get access to good ca cancer care. The best cancer care is in Lexington, Kentucky, which is the Western side, which is three or four hours away. And when it snows, they can't even get out of their homes. So maybe we could use telemedicine. Well, we think this answer is more complex than that. And so what we decided to do was to go in and to do a bottom-up and a top-down approach. We do have external experts. The person pictured there is from the University of Kentucky Cancer Center. And we also have the community workers, the people who live in the area who already are helping, already understand the problems of the people living there. They themselves have lived there their entire lives. And on the upper right, our expert, Tim, who is a, a very senior distinguished surgeon in cancer, um, He's considered a foreigner because even though he lives in Kentucky, he lives in Western Kentucky and these people are all in Eastern Kentucky. And so foreigners are not liked in almost any part of the world. And, but a foreigner doesn't have to be very, from very far away. So <clears throat> what we are doing is we're using the community to show us what the problems are that they experience and have them help develop the answers and what the external experts do is we're facilitators, mentors, advisors, we instruct, we help build the platforms and tools that they, the citizens, can use. And of course, we help spread the word because what we learn here can be applied elsewhere, not exactly the same way, the same principles, because each different culture is gonna require modification, but the principles might apply. And so that's one of the projects we're doing. Um, in fact, here's an example. There's Melanie McComsey who's talking. This is in Kentucky. And you can see they're doing a design exercise because you can see the, um, <coughs> the, the different colored markers and their uh, post-it notes, which so markers and post-it notes are the most powerful tools of designers and uh, they're working together. Melanie was a postdoc in our laboratory for many years. She has a PhD in anthropology from UCSD and she's now moved on to Thermal Fisher uh, so she's working in local industry. So what is the role of designer in these areas? Well, we have to have lots of different skills. We have domain experts, community experts, people who understand the politics, the economics, etc. And what designers are really good at doing, design is a method. We don't really have any content. What we can do is we can bring together all these people gather the important information from each of these experts and then develop a system of applications that actually can go after these very difficult, complex problems. Again, um, we're doing that driven by the community expertise. Another problem we call Design for San Diego, D for SD, and this is now the, th <clears throat> um, the third year of the program. And it involves people in downtown San Diego who are trying to solve the problems that they have. And so we're offering design support in this case, because of COVID-19, we modified the task. Uh, it started on uh, April 10th. This was supposed to be an in-person gathering of lots and lots of people, like 100, 200 people from the area. Uh, obviously this has been changed to a virtual system until the last jam was on April 10th, uh, actually 11th. <coughs> It's, it's, it's going to be all every Friday for three hours. Um, and there'll be community feedback and we'll have a final proposal by May 8th, we hope. And then we'll actually start trying to implement and do some of this in the area of downtown San Diego. And we're together not only with the people who live there, but with uh, the mayor's office and other people, other of the uh, community organizations that are in the downtown San Diego area. Another one is, this is what was actually talked about last week, is a COVID-19 rapid response team, which is, uh, it was started by um, people from the medical school and Eli Spencer, who's a faculty member of the design lab 
and also a physician, an infectious disease physician in the medical school and hospital system, to put together this website called Earth 2.0, which is our nice notion for changing the world from what it is to what it should be, um, which has lots and lots of different components in it. But one of the major things is <clears throat> we allow people to send in the problems that they have. There might be someone who's sick and doesn't understand the symptoms and wants to have some answers, but it might be a physician who says, we're desperately running out of, uh, of the following medication, or we're having really trouble knowing how to sanitize these one time, mm -hmm. the single use masks so we can use them over and over again, or we're having trouble with ventilators. And so we have a big crew of people. It's a large number of people from across the country with many, many different disciplines, because in order to solve the problem, we need people who understand behavior. We need people who understand the medical issues. We need people who understand mechanical engineering, and for that matter, thermodynamics, and for that matter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And design is a really good way of putting all of this together. And so this is a group of people, but what's interesting is that of this group of the leadership, four people are from the design lab. And there's a much greater long list of people and it goes on and on and on. And I've outlined in green, all the members of the design lab. So design is already playing a major role in our approaches to COVID-19. So humanity center design is we focus on the people, society, culture, environment, and humanity. And it's a way of thinking. So in the 21st century, designers are going to have very different skills than what we're used to training designers for. We have to change the way we train designers. And my goal is actually that everybody in the university should learn the basics of design because you can use design in any field you imagine because it's all about thinking differently, thinking about the real problem, thinking about how people interact. Writers need that. Artists need that. Um, engineers need that. Social scientists, they have a lot of those skills, but they don't have the technological skills necessarily. You need a whole bunch of skills to approach these problems and that's why designers can do it. So you in the audience, what can you do? Thank you. So that's sort of my introduction. And now we'll use the remaining time. I'd like to answer questions. Um, okay, so uh, last time we tried to use the chat and we got a whole bunch of mixed feelings about people seeing the chat or not. This time, I don't see any comments that came up uh, in the chat itself. Um, so I, what I suggest is that um, we turn to moderate uh, uh, people who want to ask questions now, but I would like to take the, the privilege of <laughs> being the, the moderator to kick it off, Don, and um, to, to really get back, to go deeper at the sense of the students in the audience when they listen to Andrew Bird talk yesterday and listen to you today, and there'll be a series of very interesting talks uh, in the continuation of the series, when they want to make a connection between what they're doing today, they're sitting in a class, am I a designer? They're participating in one of these projects. How is that connected to design? Can you give them some uh, like bits uh, that they could hook onto to, to feel that they're, they're on the path? Actually, one of the things I want is I want the students to provide it because we are moving into a whole new area and where designers are going to be doing things that designers have never done. It's not well defined yet because I remember I think of it as a way of thinking. In fact, the word design is maybe the wrong word. Many of the most advanced design schools and practitioners that I know of don't like the word design, but just we don't know what else to call it. But it's a new way of thinking. And it's a way of thinking that, first of all, is a system. See, the university is very interesting. That the university is one of the problems. The university has evolved not by intention so much, but into a field of specialties. And each specialist is really important and really good, and they develop more and more detailed knowledge about whatever their specialty is, and that's very valuable. But all they know is their specialty. 
and you get the reinforcement, the way you get promoted in university. We heard this last week, by the way. Remember, we, he showed us a picture of a, of a physics journal, and he said, how many authors do you think had in this one paper? Well, in some of the physics articles, the list of the names of the authors is longer than the article itself. And the, one of the articles he pointed at had a thousand authors, a thousand people banding together to solve one problem collaboratively. That's not what we do in the university. The university is very competitive. The students don't understand this. But the faculty, they get rewarded by um, what publications they've done, what advancement in knowledge have you done. And um, if you work with too many people, the promotion committees say, oh, how do we know how much you did? You have to do more papers by yourself so we can evaluate you, which is exactly the wrong attitude. The wrong, the correct attitude would be, yes, it's wonderful. You banded together with different groups of people and look at all the wonderful results. It ought to be collaborative. The other things, because of the efforts to get money in order to do your research and the effort to get promoted, people are starting to publish more and more and more papers, most of which are very small are not very important. And, you know, I'm very old, so I can remember that when I was trained, I, in fact, I was one scolded for publishing too much. When I was trained, the idea was to sit back and to think hard about the issues and to try to, to, try to make a paper, a statement, a research problem that would actually make a difference in the world. It had, and that meant thinking through a whole bunch of different issues and we don't reward that anymore. And that's a problem. And that's a really major problem. And that's actually one of the major issues that we heard about last week. I don't think it was explained well enough to, because I think the speaker thought that most of the people were faculty members, as opposed to a lot of you are students and not aware of what's going on with the poor lives of the faculty who have to publish and publish and publish and get research grants so they can pay the graduate students who can do the research so they can publish and publish and publish. It's gotten to be a very bad situation. And what I love to see about design is that we're no longer specialists. What we are is we cut across, the specialties are vertical and the design goes horizontally across all of the behavior in the, in the university. Because we have to use it to solve these major societal issues. And we have to be rewarded for being generalists, for being able to piece it together and do something that makes a difference in the world. Now, when the students are taking a course, they're usually taking a course from a, general, from a specialist. So they're learning some techniques of human-computer interaction or, or maybe a new biological mechanism or a new mechanical engineering problem. And mechanical engineering, more, engineering is more and more applied mathematics and less and less of building and creating things. And so it's going to be up to the students, you who are students right now listening to this, as you learn the different areas, your job is to think back about, oh, I can see where this might be useful in this other problem, which your professor may not even know that, but you're gonna be learning a tremendous amount of knowledge that can actually be applied and can be useful, but it's gonna be up to you to figure out where to apply it. Great, I'm getting a couple, uh, some comments, more comments now. Yeah. So and here I also is wanted one more thing, and I'm going to interrupt you, sorry, because uh, some people can't seem to be able to raise their hands. It's not showing up in the participant window. Uh, but if you want to raise any particular thing, I'll, I'll search for you. Yeah. And um, I, and then so to open the chat to everyone. Can, I is did, it... I think. Okay. Um, so the chat is now open to everybody. So uh, when you want to write it, uh, select the two and go all the way up to the top of your uh, send chat to window and it should be everyone is there. So then okay. everyone can see it. So let me uh, read one from uh, Sef Shia. Uh, the skill mentioned seem very diverse and hard to develop. How do you think uh, would be good way to start practicing or developing these skills? Uh -huh. That is the question. <clears throat> that uh, Michael Meyer and I have said is going to be critical. The point is as educators, how do we educate you to understand these wide variety of issues? Now, no one's gonna know everything. That's why we always have specialties. Every field has specialties. So in design, we have a large number of specialties so that uh, 
someone who does interaction design, which at UCSD is primarily what we teach. Uh, we sometimes call it human computer interaction, but it's more than that. It's about how people interact with things, people, society, technology. Um, they don't know, know anything about uh, industrial design. We don't teach industrial design here. It's a very different field. It's the industrial design people who make the physical objects and they're, they're concerned about materials and form and color and shape. And, and um, how do we train? But you know, this is true of every single field. You go look at, if you say I'm an engineer, well, you're a civil engineer, you have no idea what a computer scientist does. Uh, they're very different. But there is a common base, which is mathematics and the understanding of science and physics and biology and chemistry and simple computation and um, how to do experiments and the value of evidence and statistics. But then you, then you learn your own domain area of specialty that you care about. And uh, how we should train people, we do not yet know because it'll vary. What we will do at UC San Diego is gonna be different. It might be done at, I don't know, Parsons School of Design or Scan uh, La Savannah College of Art and Design. And so what we wanna do is have a framework where each school can develop it itself, but we don't know the answers. That's why we're embarking on this experiment. So I'm sorry, but I don't know the answers, but, but you should take that as a good thing. Because if you're interested in design, that means you're entering now when we're about to dramatically change what we do in design and how we do it. And that means you can be part of this change, that you can do things that you know, we didn't think about, that can actually change the course of the field. So this is a great time to be a student entering the field. So okay, uh, I, I have a but, question, an actual hand up, but you can do your follow up. Go ahead, Deborah. Uh, so just uh, one question. So Jack Silberman is interested in uh, is crowdsour and crowdsourcing. So uh, when people from a lot of different backgrounds kind of contribute and are there good examples in your mind of uh, crowdsourcing as uh, resolving design issues or dissolving complex problems? Well, most of the good crowdsourcing has come the ones that I know about have come from dividing up a very big problem into lots of small areas and then people work in the different areas. And that's how a lot of advances in, um, in chemistry have come about on biochemistry where people are given some little puzzle to work on, but lots and lots of different people play around or do things and they make advances. Or um, the, the standard example we'd like to use here is Albert Lin's search for the tomb, the tomb of Genghis Khan where um, people had looked for it for, forever and ever. And uh, what he did was he got aerial photos of the areas of Mongolia, which were most likely. And um, they weren't aerial or satellite photographs, but it was too much for anybody to look at. So he, he started a little company to crowdsource it. So people could go in, pick up any area, and they could, their job was to mark things that they thought might look interesting because they were very carefully told not what to look for, because the hope was that they would find interesting things that, oh, we hadn't thought about looking for things like that. And that worked. They actually put it all together and they found lots of things and they showed it to uh, archeologists who had studied the area who would say, oh, we know about that, that's a trail. Oh, we know about that, that's a burial mound. Well, that was good actually, because that sort of validated that what the people were finding were useful. Because every so often they'd say, oh, we didn't, we've never seen that. That's really interesting. And so then you can go in there and look and try to excavate and see what really is going on. Um, there have been other advances in crowdsourcing. Um, I know that companies are using it to get novel ideas. And uh, there though, you're not so much getting the people working together, but rather each person is given the ideas and then works either by themselves or with whatever little group of people they have together. But Crowdsourcing is both powerful, but also it's more difficult than you might think. If you enlist thousands of people to work with you, well, how do you handle the thousands of people? And how do you actually uh, decide what's good, what's useful and what isn't useful? So there's a whole bunch of different techniques we have which have powers in one direction and weaknesses in other directions. And that's, well, that's life. 
And it sounds like what you've done with the COVID-19 is almost like curated expert crowdsourcing or some, some uh, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so have Colleen- a brave soul, yeah, Brianna. Yeah. If you can hear me out there, I see you smiling. Can you oh, ask your hi. question? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Don, for doing this and for everybody for organizing this. Uh, my question was, what uh, design flaw do you see in, like glaring design flaw do you see in American society that you would like immediately fix post COVID? Like what, in terms of sanitation, is there anything, if, if there is anything that, that sticks out to you? Because I think, because I've noticed a lot of political leaders talking about um, touch-free, uh, uh, elevator buttons and things like that and like what is something that you think like that should have been changed ages ago if there's anything well there are a lot more serious problems than uh than buttons that we touch um you know we've lived with those for a long time without all coming down with diseases in fact um <laughs> my favorite infectious disease physician um, tells you that this is before COVID-19 if you drop a piece of food on the floor, pick it up and eat it. Because it's essential that we actually eat bad things. We eat dirt. We eat, uh, that's how you build up the immune system. So it's a, it's a very complex system. You have to be careful. Now, today, you don't want to do that. Actually, I still do it in my home because <laughs> my wife and I haven't left the home for, what, a month and a half now, and, and no new person has come in either. But uh, you wouldn't want to do that in a more public place. The, the problem, I think, we know a lot about what should be done. It's really hard to do it. And one of the hardest things to do is, there are two hard things that are really hard to do. They're related. One is maintenance. And the second is uh, something, uh, anticipation, dealing with anticipated things. We've known about the danger for, of epidemics, <clears throat> pandemics. And lots of really good people will devise all sorts of plans for working on it. And yet, when this one came, everybody was unprepared. In fact, Japan, uh, China had a very, very good system for reporting the uh, problems that would have allowed early reports to be compiled early and it would have sent the word out. But it, it had already been deployed and had been tested, but it wasn't used in this particular case for all sorts of complex behavioral reasons. Most of the issues we face are behavioral. Our infrastructure is crumbling. The bridges are all falling down. They're about to ding. A lot of them have gotten grades of D and Fs by, by the societies that have examined them. Uh, and the same with our sanitation systems. The pipes, are, some of them are 100 or 150 years old, and they're designed to last 40 or 50 years. And when sewage leaks out of the pipes, that's dangerous. Um, we have a problem with homelessness in, the, in San Diego. In fact, we have cholera epidemics in San Diego. And we can send in the medical people to cure the cholera, but that's the curing the symptoms. Now, why do they have cholera? Well, bad sanitation. Well, why do they have bad sanitation? Well, they don't have homes. They don't have toilets. We could destroy toilets around, but we don't. We could try to figure out the homeless problem, but when you start to do that, it, it to get at the core of that is a bunch of other issues. So it, it's not as simple as <clears throat> let's make touchless elevator control buttons. That's the simplest of thing and probably the least important and least valuable. So great. we nice. have another, that's great, thank you. We have thank another you so hand much. raised. Yeah. Hannah, Zeng, if you are out there, uh, thank you. If you could unmute, that'd be great. Oh yeah, thank you. Um, my question is, what might be the challenge for designers in a, in a remote collaboration mode, like such as in an open source community? Um, designers, I think design and legal cross said is important for designers to define the, the not so clearly design, uh, defined problem. How would you define or um, approach to the COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in today? Thank you. Um, I believe that um, <clears throat> in, in many ways, we, we understand the, the disease enough to know what behavioral methods we should take to, to stop it. 
And the behavioral methods are the ones that we're all taking, the reason that we're here on uh, video instead of being in person. And it's keeping a distance of two meter rule, which is widely violated, is actually not enough, it turns out. We have to be slightly, slightly more. But uh, keeping people apart is how you prevent the spread. But it's very difficult behaviorally, first of all. But second of all, it has a really bad side effect, which is mainly the bankruptcy of the country. The, the economic system of the country is very bad, in very bad shape. And we're not sure how that's going to recover. We're not sure how long it will take and what it will take. And um, the other thing we need is a lot of support groups. But in my experience, is that's happening. In fact, what, one thing that I've noticed is that as we're learning to use video, many people are finding the videos is even a better way of getting people together. So my wife uh, is a member of several different book groups, one of which is in Palo Alto, mm -hmm. Northern California. And a couple of them are here in San Diego. But it turns out that in, even in San Diego, if you have people in North County and people in downtown, it's very hard for them to get together. <clears throat> and Today, it makes it a lot easier. So we no longer have to think about where somebody is. We simply say, Here, here's when it's going to be, and you can call in from any place in the world. Just like <laughs> I see Hiroshi Ishii on the screen right now, and he's in, at MIT. He couldn't have traveled here just to hear this talk. Um, John Seeley Brown, you're probably in what? The Palo Alto area? Um, his home in Palo Alto was only a few blocks from my home in Palo Alto. Um, and uh, but you can come in because you wouldn't fly down here just for this. And so I think the designers and all, not just the design community, but all are finding it much easier to do a lot of distant work today. We still need better tools. Now that's a design issue. We don't have great tools for collaboration. You can see how badly the chat works. The chat really isn't the ideal way of having people interact. Um, and so we're still learning. But I think this is actually, if you take a look at the positive side of what we're being forced to do, is we're learning new ways of interacting. And some of them are going to be very positive and may, I think they'll stick around for a while. Cool. If I could uh, go to another comment. Now that the chat is, uh, is available, then people can see each other. But there's still a comment from when they were sent privately. And this is Rahul. And he's asking, as future designers, do you think we need to focus on our specialty first? Um, or learn as a generalist? And how do you convince those C-level execs that uh, you need generalists and organizations who will design across disciplines? First problem. Um, we actually have recommended <clears throat> that at UC San Diego, we do not have a undergraduate major in design. We think it is far more important for every designer to have a wide range of experience and backgrounds and to know some topic well in depth. So major in some topic, not design. Sure, you can do a design minor. And the first degree that we are thinking of offering is the MDES, the Master of Design. And we're thinking of introducing it as a fifth year program so that after four years at UCSD, if you've taken a design minor in one year, you can get a master degree in design. Um, it'll be the kind of design we're, I've been talking about, design as a way of thinking. You won't be any good at making beautiful, pretty objects. You won't be very good at industrial design. We don't do that here. But you'll be really good at some things. But because you have the general knowledge, that will make a big difference. Now, not everybody agrees with me. In fact, I'm, there, I'm on a design mailing list that goes all across the world, and we, I sent our paper to them. And, just this morning, somebody raised a great big prop, a big letter saying, this is horrible. What do you mean you don't get, get an undergraduate degree in design? What do you mean you should do something else? You won't be a great designer if you do that. Well, there's lots of debates. Uh, there's no easy answer. And so actually, I think in our curri curriculum proposal, we will let some schools offer the undergraduate degree, yes. But I am bothered if you graduate from a design school you spend four years learning the craftsmanship of design. You don't learn anything about the world. You don't learn anything about other disciplines. And I don't see how you can be a good citizen, let alone a great designer that way. Now, the other question you asked, 
how do you convince people in a company that you, uh, you're a great generalist? No, you don't advertise yourself as a great generalist. That's not what you do. You advertise yourself that I can help you move your company forward. See, look, designers really ought to be at the sea level. There ought to be a chief design officer in every major company who says, look, I understand people, what people really need, and therefore you need to help me. I ought to be helping you decide what products you should be developing. But designers, very few of them are at that level, uh, not at a big company. And the reason is, I think, because designers are not well trained. Because I ask designers, they tell me, the company doesn't understand what I'm doing. They don't support me. And I say, well, how do you convince them that you're doing something important? I go to my bosses and I show them the prizes we won and I show them how beautiful the stuff is. Or I tell them how bad, how much trouble people have with our equipment. If only I could change it, it would be better. And I say, yeah, well, I was the vice president at Apple actually. And if anybody had come to me with what you just told me, I would say, well, of course you do good work. That's why we hired you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I have to go back to work. And if you said um, that, well, here are the problems, I'd say, I don't want to hear the problems. And it's not that I don't want bad news, but telling me the problems doesn't do any good. I want you to tell me the solutions. And I want you to think about what's best for the people, not what's best for design. I don't want you to say, how could you ruin my great design? Well, well somebody ruined it, the marketing people or engineers ruined it because it wasn't working properly. You have to think as, you have to think across the company, you have to think what's good for society. That's how you get promoted in the company. But start off doing small things. It takes a while, you have to build your own skills and understand the company, but you have to think more broadly. The way I promoted people at Apple was not are you really a great technical person, those get promoted, but on the technical track. But what I looked for was somebody who thought hard about what was good for the company and what we could do that would really advance the company itself. And sometimes that would mean killing the work that they had been working on. And that's the mark of a really good person who's going to say, we ought to move in a different direction. Right. By the way, there is a company I want to give credit to, and that's Phillips. Phillips, which is now mostly a healthcare problem, uh, one of the, uh, uh, Sean Carney, uh, is a chief design officer of Philips, and every week he spends time with the CEO of Philips, and they're devising new healthcare products that are marvelous, just wonderful, things that people, normal people never thought they needed, and now they're discovering how much better the new systems are because the designer is in charge. Great, thank you, Don. There, if you're willing to take a few more questions, there's some hand raised ones. And so Dorothy Howard, if you're willing to show yourself or, oh, there you are, I see you. Hi, Don. Um, Hi. So my question is about um, design education and a lot of conversations, you know, have been happening about ethics in recent years, um, and I'm wondering how kind of in, uh, ecological understanding uh, mm -hmm. or environmental science might be an important part of design education. I, I'm, and what you, how you think we can, um, we can incorporate ecological thinking into design education to make designers think about uh, the environmental impact of uh, technology, in particular um, waste when uh, a society is oriented towards consumption and the current models that we have um, of you know industries and companies to, to make products that are easily outmoded by the next thing and how you know apple is designing um different plugs all the time so you have to buy a new plug and now we have uh, so much e-waste that uh we're having these problems so how do you think we can put uh, ecological thinking into a design education well first of all um, i think it's essential and my my recommendation for education is that we stop teaching more specialized courses but actually have project courses because when you do a when you you're learning 
a, a specialty, you don't really have time to understand all the implications. But if you're working on a project, the project means you have to think about a whole bunch of different issues. Uh, and maybe the, the way I would do a project, I would do some real projects. Now, a real project can't be done in 10 weeks. It might take 30 weeks. It might take 60. It might, it, in the companies, uh, it takes two years usually to bring out a new device or even a modification. So why not let there be a real project? And that when you take the class, you enter the project wherever it happens to be and you spend your 10 weeks learning about it. But that way, you'd be exposed to all these different components and aspects that are the constraints that you must learn. And you would learn it along the way. But we also have to change the way society works. So in my opinion, one of the big enemies is a man named Milton Friedman. He's a Nobel Prize winning economist. He's dead now. But uh, he said that a company owes its loyalty to its shareholders, not to its employees, not to its customers, not to the communities in which it is based. And I think that has led to one of the major problems we have. There are people who look at short-term gains because the shareholders are all trying to make a profit off their shares. They're not thinking about what's great for the world. They want to buy their shares and if they go up in price, sell them immediately. They don't, they don't have a long-term vision. And that has harmed the, um, the people who work because they get rewarded for a profitability, short-term profitability. You want to be rewarded for long-term profitability. So a lot of the issues that you brought out, Dorothy, would be automatically solved if we simply rewarded the people appropriately for doing something that was, first of all, why don't companies have to pay the cost of what's, what the economists call externalities? So if I manufacture something and I have lots of waste material, I dump it into the lakes and streams. I shouldn't be allowed to do that. I should have to pay for the cleanup. I should have to pay to clean this before I can dump it. Or I should have to pay to not to change the, the way I manufacture so I don't have the waste material. And the same with when I manufacture something that can't be easily recycled. Well, recycling is a myth. Recycling is actually the way that the, the plastics companies are saying, we don't have to deal with it because you could just recycle it, except the recycling system doesn't work. Can you understand what, how you recycle something? You can't. Can you recycle a milk carton? If you look it up on the website, they'll say, yes, milk cartons can be recycled. If you look it up on the San Diego recycler, they'll say, no, we can't recycle milk cartons. So in theory, milk cartons can be recycled. In practice, very few companies can because it's cardboard coated by plastic that is difficult and expensive to separate. And there's no market for it. So yes, we should be teaching ethics. Yes, we should be teaching the impact of what we're doing on, on the world. It isn't just the, the environment, by the way, it's also society. Uh, but I think the best way to teach that is, first of all, within real projects where they, they, those come are important. But second of all, that's one reason I want the designers to get a broad education, why you should learn as much as you can about other areas because the correct solution is an economic solution and a political solution, and one that changes the way we reward people in this society. Great, thank you, Don. Uh, it's 5.08, there's a few more questions, some hands still up if you're still willing to go. Don, how are you feeling about it? I can keep yes? going. Okay, so Ron Campbell, I'm just going uh, by the order that the, the hands went up, so Ron, I can see you. Um, if you'd like to ask Don your question, go ahead and unmute yourself, or I can help you with that. Well, I, can you hear me? I just unmute. I did. I unmuted you, Don. Okay. okay. Hi, Don. Um, a couple of quick questions. You know, with based on your work with Dexcom and continuous glucose monitors, can you envision that we might have some kind of monitoring device? to detect things like may, maybe a more general device that would also um, monitor other things like besides blood sugar, like um, uh, blood pressure, but also exposure to viruses. And then the other question is, what, what are some challenges designers may face? You know, we've heard a lot of comparisons and like authoritarian societies versus free societies, that the authoritarian societies have been more successful 
in dealing with the virus because of the nature of government and people are more compliant. So what are some challenges you think designers might have in um, stepping in and helping out with uh, this solutions to this, this issue? Well, the first question is, uh, are we developing other sensors for medical use? Yes, there's a wide variety of people working on a wide variety of sensors. There is a danger, though, that some, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the problems come from behavior. And um, there's a real issue in our society about monitoring people's behavior. Uh, it's, you, you lose your privacy, you lose security. Uh, people say, well, why should it matter if I'm not doing anything illegal? Well, it does matter because a lot of things that we do are not illegal, but in fact are frowned upon by society or might be frowned upon by your boss. You might want to actually complain about your company, which is perfectly legal and sensible. And you may even be correct, but it won't. But to do it in, with anonymity is important. In fact, our whole voting system is based upon the ability to do things anonymously and not to, know, not to let people know how you voted or else you're subjected to pressures. Some, some people might insist that you vote in a certain way. Your boss might insist or will fire you. And um, so privacy and security is really critical. Uh, but we are developing more and more powerful uh, sensors that are gonna be very valuable in medicine. It's gonna be hard to do a virus detector, I think, because viruses mutate and they're very complex. And that's beyond my understanding. That's not my field. Now, the other question you asked is, um, again, because most of the issues are behavior and we pride ourselves in the United States on being a free nation where essentially our behavior is uncontrolled and we can do whatever we like with certain restrictions. Um, we already see people balking against having to, to stay at home. Why can't we have large church services? Because how can you have a religion without have all everyone getting together? And it's a violation of freedom of religion for you to force us not to, not to get together. And as you point out in an authoritative, in, in some governments, the dictatorships basically, you can, you can just simply force people. Um, that's not the way we'd like to live. And the theory in the United States is that we may have to do that in cases of crisis and COVID-19 is clearly a crisis and the coronavirus is clearly the cause, um, but we'd like to be, make sure we can go back to our normal lives afterwards. And that's going to be hard. Our freedom of speech means that um, people can produce, can lie, have false information. They're burning uh, cellular towers in, in England because there's a rumor that 5G cellular uh, technology is causing uh, COVID-19, the disease. And there's a trivial basis for that, which is that we do know that high energy radiation can weaken the immune system, but high energy, and then we're not talking about high energy in this case. And there's been lots of scientific studies, none of which supports this, but they're killing people and burning towers. And um, but that's the price you pay <laughs> for our system of government. And I don't know the answer there's, you know, I, I, we all know Winston Churchill's famous statement that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. Don't know the answer. Singapore is often held up as a great example of a small company run by a quasi dictatorship, but a friendly one, a bit beneficent one. But with, you know, Singapore is an island. It's relatively small and that works just fine. I was just at San Marino, the Republic of San Marino. It's basically one small city and it's been governed for hundreds and hundreds of years. They have a really interesting governorship that they have two people who are the leaders. One is sort of from the, from the elite and one is from the workers. And it's the two. They, everybody else in the United States, in most countries, we say you have to have an odd number. In case of a tie, you have to have somebody to break the tie. And they deliberately said, we only want two, an even number, because we don't want to have ties. We want it when there's an issue that they manage to agree. It may take them a while, but they managed to convince the other person so that they both agree. And it's, it's lasted for hundreds of years. But again, it's a very small, tiny country, and it's extremely wealthy. 
So no easy answers to your question, but those are good questions. Yeah. Uh, there's another one, uh, Stephanie uh, Marillo, you have your hand up still, are you out there? Yeah, hi. Okay. Um, Go ahead. So you talked about addressing the causes instead of the symptoms for design challenges. And so I've been noticing a lot, especially with COVID, we're realizing that a lot of the causes of problems we're seeing are institutional. So how do we as individual designers um, approach designing on a smaller scale or products for uh, our current institution? Should we be anticipating changes and hoping that they are taken into effect? Or should we be kind of just designing with what is already existing? Well, the word hoping is wrong um, because we have to understand when you, if you have to hope, it means that you, you're not, you don't believe that people might do this or you're hoping that people might somehow agree and, and follow whatever you've done. And we have to do better than that because we know that people don't. People will vary. People want to understand it. If they don't understand, they won't do it. Or they want to know if, if it harms them or, and staying alone at home harms you. Uh, well, what are the benefits that are happening, not only to me, but to society? And we have to become behavioral scientists so that we actually also incorporate the understanding of behavior into our design. Now, the problem is we don't understand enough about human behavior to know what the correct answers are. We do not know. And in some sense, it's a good thing we don't know because I don't want to know so much about people and human behavior that I can completely manipulate people into doing things that they might not otherwise want to do. <clears throat> so what we have to do is, it's, well, it's a philosophy that came out of the wonderful work of Rich Thaler and um, I forget the other author um, on the book Nudge, which is we have to nudge people gently to do things that are good for them. If, if people really should be saving money <clears throat> that we have to make it so it's so easy to save money, they're not even aware that they're saving money, but 10 or 15 years later, they'll be surprised at how much money they've saved. Or if you want to eat healthy food, but you make the cafeteria so that the unhealthy food is hard to reach, and, uh, and so on. And so there are things one can do. And actually, when Thaler, who's an economist, uh, wrote the book, it's interesting. He was, he's at the University of Chicago in the economics department, although he seems to spend some of his time at Brady here at UC San Diego. Uh, he came to me when I was at Northwestern and said, I'm doing a design book. And uh, so he wanted me to comment on the book and I decided he really was. He was writing a book about applied design, even though he's an economist. And that's again, another way, by the way, is that um, just learning about design, you're not gonna be a successful designer because there are all sorts of other things that impact design in the way we think. But I don't have any easy answers for you because look, I don't work on problems where there are easy answers. They're not interesting. I only work on things where I don't know the answer. That's great. Okay, we have one more question from Anish Sinha. Are you out there? Yes. All right, there you are. Hi. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Don, this is expanding on the Kentucky example you had given earlier in the presentation. Uh, when a designer is considered a foreigner, how do they establish trust with the community that they're working with and display to the community that they're there to solve the real <clears throat> problems and the root problems rather than push an agenda onto them? They can't. That's why we say we don't do that. That's why... Um, you have to work with the people who are already there. And, and, and they are the front, they're the people who are gonna talk and they're the people who are gonna interact with the rest of the community and we have to be in the background. So where are you from? I'm from UCSD. No, no, before that you, you have, uh, can, it looks like an Indian name. Yes, yes, um, so I'm from Northern India, New Delhi. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you an example from Bangalore, um, that they have a group that they call it the angry or even the ugly Indians. Um, and what they do is a group of people who live there who say, look, we have people spitting on the streets and spitting on the walls 
and throwing their trash on the, uh, you know, here's the street and then there's a sidewalk and then there's a bit of plants and then there's a fence. Say. They throw their trash right there on the green stuff. And uh, that's just, it's disgusting. How can we stop it? And the way they decided to stop it was very clever. First of all, the, the, the everyday people did this. They said, well, why don't we paint the fences and make them pretty so people won't spit on them? And second, why don't we plant nice plants on the grass, on the area there? So again, it looks clean and looks nice and so people won't throw trash there. And that's what they did. And they, what they did, they didn't ask for permission either. They just went and did it because they knew getting permission would be impossible. But they did several things. First of all, they, en they enlisted people who lived in the area to come and help. And it was like a three or four hour stint. That's all. They do a whole bunch of small projects each three or four hours in length. And um, if you want to do the city streets, so they do it many, many weeks, but it's three hours stretch at a time. And um, when, and it turns out it works. Now it doesn't work unless people maintain it. But a lot of the people, once they saw how clean it was, they, may, they volunteered to maintain it. So this is citizen run. And it's really nice because um, when the journalists discovered it and they said, well, whose, whose idea was this? They didn't take credit. What they did is they figured out what politician was responsible for giving them permission. And they said, it was him. And they made, listed the name of the person who he probably didn't even know it happened. But that way the person couldn't object because everybody came and said, what a wonderful idea. Well, here's the issue though. Uh, and and look, I'll take urination. Men urinate on the, on the street. They, they usually find a corner, say where a fence bends or something, or they find a tree or something and they urinate and they have to go. So, so they finally decided what we should do is we'll install uh, urinals and they install urinals, uh, which didn't require water. There are waterless urinals and that solved the problem. And I said, but what about women? Well, women don't urinate in the street, so we don't, that's not a problem, so we don't have to solve it. So I talked to some women, and they said, yeah, we're not allowed to. That's not proper for us. Men can do it, but women couldn't. So we simply don't drink any water before we have to go out, or we learn to hold it in, which both of those are medically bad. And the same in general, why are people throwing the trash there? I mean, shouldn't there be a place for them to throw the trash? So they were, trial, they were solving the symptoms and uh, they weren't solving the, system, the systemic problem. They weren't solving all the problems. But I think here's where we could go and work with them because I spent a whole day with them, the entire day. And it was really very enjoyable. And I thought they were very insightful and very clever. But I think they could use some assistance on the back end to help them attack the larger problem. But that's what the designers in some sense ought to be invisible because of the very problem you mentioned, that if, if I start sticking my head in there, come on, what do I know about what goes on in India? And um, yeah. I just wanted to mention that uh, as time is uh, coming up to, uh, to 5.30, that um, we have all the comments and we have Don. Uh, we, so if you continue to ask questions uh, within the next couple of days, at least for the students, we'll have an active, uh, we'll have an active ability to, to respond to them. And if other people are interested, we'll find a way to make those available as well. Actually, I see an... Uh just a comment that I see a question, actually it was from uh, Dorothy, I think, who says, well, are there really good examples in the classes at UCSD? And um, I don't know the answer, but we could take the initiative and say, why don't we send it to our design lab faculty and ask them for examples and then send them back. I so think I also we have Adam Aaron, that's gonna be one of the speakers in our talk series and he's teaching a class uh, and Deborah, you might correct me on the title of it, but it's, it's design and climate change or- Well, it's a psychology, psychology of climate change. Thank you, thank you, yeah. So he will be coming to uh, speak in this uh, series. So I think it would be worthwhile to see what he's talking about. So. Yeah, and he's actually gonna talk about how he designs a course. So I think the students will be able to see uh, the design idea and design method and design thinking at several layers that are actually relevant to them. Here's one professor telling them what he thinks about when he designs a, a course on psychology and climate change. 
Um, uh, but see, I would say, why is he designing the course? Why isn't he having the students help him design the course? I think he takes the students very seriously. Uh, so uh, maybe it's my see, miss. There's miss, a course uh, yeah. here. I, I saw that Jim Levin's name was here. Jim is uh, now a retired faculty member from the uh, education department here at UCSD, but he was a graduate student of mine early, early on in the years. It shows you how old I am when my students have retired. But um, the, um, he, Jim, and a few others caused me to change the way I was teaching the introductory psychology department dramatically. And they came to me and said, instead of giving lectures that everybody gets, you know, who, who learns from lectures? We know we don't learn from lectures. Why don't we make it self-paced? And what we'll do is we'll spend a whole year making videos and making special course sessions and so on. And so students can read the chapters of the book. It happened to be a book I had written, so that was nice. Uh, they'll read the chapters of the book and they'll take exams on them. But here's what we'll do. The exam will be a 10 question exam, multiple choice. And if they pass it, good, we'll say, you know this topic. And if they don't pass it, we'll say, hmm, you didn't pass it, okay, no problem. Um, and we divided the course material up, since it's a 10 week course with three lectures a week, has 30 lectures. So there were roughly 30 units in the course. And they could learn as many of the units they liked in whatever order they liked. They would just study that. And when they felt it was, they were ready to take a test, they would go and take a test. And if they passed it, good, checked off. And you get an A if you passed 12, 26, say. I don't remember the numbers. And you get a B if you only passed 20, 20 or something. So we, you got the grade depending on how many, because you either pass or you don't pass. No grades. Because the questions were, they were maybe multiple choice, 10, but they were hard. Uh, and so um, I like that, that little segments. And you simply say, did you know it or not? And then did you, did you get a grade depending on what you knew, how much you knew. And if you didn't pass, well, you study again and take it again if you want. If you didn't pass a second time, do it a third time. If you failed the third time, okay, you're not allowed to do it a fourth time until you come in for individual tutoring. So the students could decide, all right, I'm not good at that section. I'm not even going to try it. I'm going to do something else in its place. Or they could come in for tutoring. And I thought, you know, it didn't feel like teaching. It was kind of funny. But I think I also felt the students learned more in that course than any other course I've ever taught. It was a huge amount of work, though, for the, the TAs. Jim was a TA at that point. All the TAs and for me, uh, every night I would show up to help answer questions and tutor students and the CAs were had even a higher load but it was all volunteer work on their part and they all and they made me change that course into a thing I think was wonderful and we want to do more of that let the students and the teaching assistants who know much more about the problems that students are facing than than the professor the professor knows the material far too well yeah uh, some of the uh... Uh, chat reminded me to make a plug for Global Ties. Global Ties is a, pro is a program in the engineering school that has been very successful in getting students engaged with uh, NGOs to do uh, effective design and actually resolve the, the problem of moving across quarters. So they have these continuity uh, uh, processes that allow them to keep uh, years and decades even. Of, of there are a number of those programs. Uh, Global Ties, it's T-I-E. And yeah. um, I noticed that Jack Silverman had asked a question. He does his wonderful project on robotic wheelchairs and robotic uh, cars and so on. That the student, I've watched the students in that group and they're fantastic. The, the organizational structure is very complex because an automobile has the transmission, the electronics, the control structure, the chassis, the suspension, um, the drive structure. And, um, and they divide up into teams, but they have to make sure those teams all fit together. And I feel that that's the proper way to educate people. There's actually one, there's a hand raised by Grace uh, Granthus, and she's going to be a speaker, um, uh, a panel member in one of our series this quarter. And so I was wondering, uh, this will be the last question, I think. So um, go ahead, Grace. Well, it is a very brief one, but I wondered if uh, you could reflect on perhaps the possibility, because I'm often thinking about this in terms of designing an educational experience and teaching students, if that class was so successful because it was maybe inadvertently or, or intentionally designed around this idea of a growth mindset, 
that both um, the students have an idea that they're allowed the space to be not experts at the beginning and then grow, um, but also a growth mindset for the instructor itself. Um, I don't know if we ever thought of it that way, but if that's a good idea, why don't I say yes, of course. <laughs> That's a nice background you put in your system. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, well, I think that is uh, the end of our meeting for today. So thank you all for coming. And uh, for the students who are in 119 and the other graduate level classes, I think uh, Don might uh, be around to answer some questions on discussion. So we'll talk about that uh, offline. Thanks. So, thanks, everybody. Good to see you. Great yeah. job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I'm going to put up a clap. Thank you. Darren. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Don. I think he's frozen, Dorothy. Oh, there he is. Hi, Don. Oh, is he? <laughs> You're quite um, can I ask another question? I know like question time is over. Yeah, I'm going to end the meeting in a minute, so go. Oh, go. you are. I'm just curious, um, I'm looking at this book that you cited, The Design for the Real World by Popatek. And I was looking and it has an introduction by Buckminster Fuller. And I've been really interested in permaculture recently and kind of reading in that direction. And I'm just curious if you think, like how you think that that is intersecting with this, like the history, is it, would you recommend this book? um as like a good read for well, as like a, a more history of design or uh yeah well, I, I, I enjoy the book but it, it is a little bit outdated today um i think the philosophy is still right on it's really on top mm -hmm. of he's absolutely correct but the examples are a bit out of date uh, okay you're thinking about design for the real world because he has many yeah books. Yeah, so the Buck Minutes, uh, the, the version I have does not have the Buck, the Bucky uh, introduction. Oh, yeah. Because okay. that probably came in a later edition. But yeah, yeah. I, oh, I see. well, I mean, look, here's what you should do. You should start reading it. And if you really enjoy it, keep going. <laughs> if you don't like it, then stop. Yeah. True. OK, <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don. I'm ending the meeting now. <laughs>